But even though you win, and even though you're being appealed, you can then file a cross appeal on other stuff that you should have won on that the court didn't rule on. And so this is kind of like fencing. I mean, you know, you're, you're, it, 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 you're, it, it's like dueling. And so you win, they appeal, now you're going to cross appeal, and, and, and you need to be prepared for that. And, and, and so the only way you're going to be able to do that is by, is by having a good record. Now, with orders, it's kind of interesting. Sometimes you want the judge to say what his reasons are, but sometimes you don't. And, and it's very strategic that if the judge doesn't say what his reasons are and you're on the losing end, you probably don't want an art, you know, a fully blown order explaining his reasoning. And then if you, if, if you are victorious, sometimes you do want it. But if you're victorious and it's on dubious grounds, you again maybe don't want it. Because if he articulates dubious grounds for why he agreed to it, you set them up for an appeal. So it is, there is so much gamesmanship involved with the trial appellate coordination process. And for me, intellectually, at my stage of my career, I find it like a rebirth in my in my law practice. And I know it, you know, and you're in a lot of lawyers in their in their early 50s, mid 50s, you know, start getting burned out. I, I'm like rejuvenated, <laughs> you know, literally by this because it, it is so intellectually stimulating to try and outflank your opponent. It's almost like three-dimensional chess. Because you, 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 it isn't just what's going on on the surface. It's, it's so much what's going on under, underneath. And if the judge made a mistake, you're giving him a chance to correct it before his appellate record looks ugly. And so you want to do that. And it's a respectful thing to do, I think. I think, yeah. I think it really yeah. is a respectful thing. Because if, if the judge made a mistake and you're telling me, maybe, instead of letting the whole world know and having him be reversed, you say, hey, you made a mistake. We're all human. You can fix it. And if he chooses not to fix it, he knows you're going on appeal. And so you have to take the human element into account here. And you have to think about what it's like to be a judge and, the, and, and, and what their docket is like and the amount of pressure that's on them. And, and the amount of pressure on these judges, particularly at the trial level, and if you do any kind of real estate or foreclosure work, is just... It's inhumane what, what they have to go through. Their dockets are ridiculous. The, the amount of support they have is terrible. They're in, in, in many cases, they're in mold-infested buildings. Many of them are getting sick. Some of them are dying early. And, and you know, this is, this is all documented, of course. And so you have to ask yourself, how do you, you know, help them do their job better? And one is, is, is like this young lady said over here, you know, have good written pleadings for every motion. So, you, so even if you can't afford a court reporter, you've, had let set, you've already established a, a, a record of, of, of what your arguments are. And you're not going to get it all out in oral argument, even if you do have a court reporter there. So you need to have that, have that written motion. And you need to take into account the human element of the judges. And so by giving them that second bite at the apple, even though you're going up on appeal, I think is a very important thing to do whenever possible, unless you think the judge is just so gone that you have to, you know, have an appellate court, you know, get involved. But, but it's, it's a very nice way to say, listen, you made a mistake. We're taking it on appeal. Here's a second shot at the apple for you.